they feel not understood by other veterans. And I wonder how much that goes into it. And have you heard anything like that where veterans like, of one generation don't feel connected to veterans of another generation? I know I've heard from a number of Vietnam veterans that came back and went to join the VFW or the American Legion and were told by the guys there, oh, you know, that wasn't a war you were in. I mean, there, there, there's a little bit of uh, uh, hostility there still from some of the guys. It's like I, I walked away from there and never, never even thought about joining again because mm. uh, the World War II and Korean guys saw Vietnam a little bit different. And I can tell you there's... One thing that was that really stood out with me is, um, like I said, I was on the board of uh, Honor Flight, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Honor Flight or your or your uh, your viewers, but it's a it's a program that takes uh, veterans back to World uh, DC to see all the various uh, monuments and such, and it started out as purely uh, to take World War II veterans back, and we were one of the first hubs that started taking Korean and then Vietnam. And there was a very distinct change in the uh, the aura of the flight. There was some anger. I You could tense the, feel mm. the anger w w when the Vietnam veterans started going. My name is Thad David. I'm a former Marine Recon Scout sniper with two deployments to Iraq. As a civilian, I've now facilitated hundreds of personal and professional development trainings across the country. And it struck me recently that the same things that help civilians will also help veterans succeed in their new roles as well. Join me as we define civilian success principles to inspire veteran victories. Welcome to another episode. I'm here today with Brad Hoops, the founder of Remember and Honor. How are you doing, Brad? Good. How about yourself? I'm doing excellent. I'm, excellent. I'm very, very excited to have you on. You're doing so much work for veterans and just for the, the veteran community in general. I'm really, really excited to unpack that. Um, and really quick, for anybody that doesn't know, what is... Uh, how, what's the elevator pitch of what is what is remember and honor? Uh, it's just a project to uh, preserve the stories of veterans, to get them down on permanent record so that they're never lost or forgotten. Okay. And so, what do you do? What does it what does it look like? Where do those stories get preserved? Well, it's it's primarily just a uh, kind of a combination between just a casual conversation with a, with a veteran and, and like a 60 minutes TV show type interview, We'd sit down and it's really their life story. Um, but with major emphasis on their, their time in the military. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And where can anybody find these? Where do you post them up? What does that look like? Yeah, I've got, uh, uh, a YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com slash at, remember and honor stories is where i've started uh started uploading them i don't have them all uploaded yet but uh chipping away at the stone with that okay yeah, that's yeah. thing growing how many do you have currently uh, nearly 600 600 yeah. is that's absolutely amazing uh what what got you into it? i mean when did you start this and what what made you want to well, do this well it was about 20 years ago and uh i had read an article about how the library of congress was starting their project, the Veterans History Project, to collect veteran stories. And I thought, well, geez, why not try to do something on the local level to feed this program? So I went out, just went out, bought a video camera, and just started doing it. It, um, it was really kind of a, a uh, I guess, a perfect storm of interest for me. I mean, I, I love history. I've always loved history. I should have been a history major. Uh, I was, um, I've always loved, enjoyed meeting people and, and learning their backstory. And I've just always had a, a, a reverence for veterans, so it just all it just all collided and and went from there. Well, that's amazing. And if being around for twenty years doing it, I would imagine that you've heard some some pretty incredible stories. Oh, it, it's it's beyond incredible to me. I mean, I I didn't serve personally, so uh, uh, you know, and I, you look at life, I guess, and you think, oh, you know, a human can only be stretched this much physically and mentally. Then you hear the story about the guy that was stretched this much, that guy that was stretched that much. And it's, uh, uh, it's just, it's truly amazing. With some mm -hmm. of these people. What was your, I mean, just thinking about all of them, what, what's your favorite, your favorite interview or the most, uh, the most amazing story, if you could pinpoint yeah, uh, you know, it. that's always a tough question. I get that asked quite a bit. I mean, it's right. much like, uh, you know, asking you, uh, tell me which one of your children's a favorite. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, 
There, there's quite a few of them, I guess, but uh, it, it's, you know, and I can honestly say of the 600, there isn't that any of them that I haven't found interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think probably, probably the crowd favorite and, and quite frankly, one of, I guess one of my favorites was a, a World War World War II veteran over in Europe, uh, Roy uh, Lehman uh, from Fort Collins, and uh, he was telling his story about uh, he was with the uh, uh, with intelligence. So he said, you know, I was close enough to the front lines that I did get shot at, but far enough back, or I was close enough to the front lines I didn't have to wear a tie, but far enough back I did get shot at. But he, but he. You know, he traveled, he rode the front line. So he saw all the death and destruction and maiming and such. And you could just really tell the sadness in his eyes 65 years later, the experiences of it. But then he told a uh, three, about a three re- reprieve when they were in, in, uh, in the Netherlands and they got put up in various families' homes. And he became instantly uh, attached to this family, in particular, their eight year old girl, uh, one of the daughters. And they just became best friends. And you could just see the, the light in his eyes, the sparkle, as he told about that three weeks. And then, uh, of course, the front line moved and he had to move on. And uh, so he had to leave the family behind. And um, that night, I mean, like all my interviews, they all seem to seep into my dreams at night. And, I, and, and that one in particular, I got the next morning. It's like, geez, I got to see if I can't find this little girl. And I was able to track her down and connect them. So what? Yeah. yeah how was, was how did he react to that? It it was pretty incredible because I, you know, I only had a, a picture. I didn't have a last name and actually I had the first name misspelled, but I, I knew the town. So I, I uh, got on the internet. I mean, th- this whole story just is testament to the power of the internet. I got on the internet and found the local newspaper and I had to jump back and forth with the translation service till I found the news tip button and, and I explained what I was doing and, and, um, didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden I got a, 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 a message from a reporter said, yeah, I'll do this story. So he did it. He goes, it'll, it'll appear on uh, Saturday morning. And uh, so I got up real early on Saturday morning, turned on the computer and boom, there she was. They had, uh, uh, her neighbor had read a, an article and I read the article and, and they t- took a picture of her and, and, uh, um, and then corresponded back. And what was really cool about that too, I must, I don't know how many emails I got from citizens in that, in that uh, uh, town reading that article. Every one of them ended with, we, we can't thank the Americans enough for what, uh, what we had, uh, you know, what America had done for us. And the, and the thing was uh, he had talked about how, uh, you know, they, they had uh, played games together and, and took walks and, and how uh, for Christmas Eve, uh, they made him feel like a family and took him to to, fam- to, to uh, their church services. And that's where they went out. That's where uh, er- er- Ermine was her name. That's where she posed for the picture that she sent that morning. And so I hadn't told uh, Roy about it. And so I took everything over and they were all excited. So we, we did a video and sent it off to them. But what was really cool was uh, the reporter then did a follow-up story with her and she talked about uh, once again about how the the games they played and the the, uh, uh, the walks they took and and uh, pulled out a diary entry where he'd signed it. And then she told the story about going. Uh, he came over and he said, "Well, we got to go. Uh, we're going to go see this great generals in town." So he walked her down there, and she sat on his lap, and he get, the general gave her a bag of donuts. And of course, as an eight year old, she had no clue who General Eisenhower was, and and. Uh, it was just uh, it was it was very cool but sadly six weeks after they connected uh she uh, got a brain tumor and passed and then mm-hmm. roy passed two years later but uh yeah so long story short yeah. that i guess if you got to pinpoint me that's my favorite story i could that i can definitely see why that that's <laughs> absolutely that's incredible what yeah. an amazing thing just to hear a story and then the fact that you were the the catalyst to that reconnection point yeah. i bet that meant the world to to both of them. Yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. Wow. And you said that one's a, a just a crowd favorite as well. Yeah. When I <clears> went <throat> uh, with the video and I, I wrote a book and that's one of the stories in the book. And that seems to be, uh, uh, everybody seems to comment on that story in particular. And yeah. for anybody listening, if you would share your, share your book. Uh, the title is reflections of our gentle warriors. Hmm. And when did you, 
when did this one come out? That came out in uh, 2015. I had, uh, it, it's kind of a roundabout uh, side thing that came out of that. I was, uh, the Loveland uh, newspaper was doing a, a series on Loveland's World War II veterans and asked me to be a contributing writer. And so I had 18 stories published and another 12 on deck to be published. And then they sold the paper and discontinued the uh, the series. And so I was getting calls from these other 12 guys saying, well, when do you think my story is going to publish? And it's like, I hate to tell you, it, it's not. They sold the newspaper. But I thought, well, geez, you know, I've got these 30 stories already. Why don't I sit down and watch a few more of my own videos, write a similar essay, essay and then bundle it all into a book? So I wrote and read, uh, uh, that was 30 stories. And then I watched another 40. It was the 70th anniversary. I thought, well, that 70 stories and the 70th anniversary. So bundled hmm. it into a book and published wow. it. So, yeah. That's and a- it's just, it's just, it's, they're they're very uh you know three or four page quick stories just uh, a wide range of service branches wide range of experiences and just to give i think people a general overview of of world war ii for those who may not know much about it or know nothing about it and hopefully uh for lack of a better word a, a gateway drug for them to want to go on and learn more about uh, that period of time yeah is and so that book in particular is specifically on World War Two. Yeah, that was just World War Two veterans. Okay. Correct. That's it sounds incredible because that's one thing I love little bite sized chunks, and having something that I can just go in and grab one page or you know, like you said, two or three pages. I can sit down, you know, I can read one section at a, a one story at, over coffee. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so you've obviously interviewed. It sounds like a, a lot of World War II veterans. Yeah, out of the six hundred, probably about four hundred are World War II. I mean, I I've never <laughs> had, uh, uh, I never set out to specifically target any veteran. I, to me, any veteran that walked out the door deserves to have their story told. But in the beginning, I I, I targeted World War II primarily just because the, the clock was ticking with that group, and and uh, yeah, so so I jumped at that, but. Uh, uh, like I said, no rules on, oh, I want a particular veteran, any veteran. I'll, I'll sit down and tell their story who would like to have it told. Have you interviewed veterans from um, pretty much every war since World War II? Yeah, I would say probably, like I said, four, probably about 400 World War II, about 100 Korean, about, and about 60 uh, Vietnam, and, and then uh, the rest you know, that have served but weren't in, in any sort of conflict. Yeah. And, okay. o- and only a few of our most recent conflicts of just a handful of, of that group. Why is that? You know, I, I, I can't uh, haven't broke into that group. And I think my thought is that uh, maybe it's still a little too fresh. I mean, everybody else, uh, the World War Two guys have had 60 plus years to chew on it. The Vietnam guys, 40, 50 years to chew on their experiences and and I think they were ready to talk. I don't know. It's just a theory, but I, I think it's it's still very fresh. And 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 our our, our most recent uh, uh, veterans are are probably still chewing on it. Really? Yeah. Do you reach out? I mean, do you actively reach out and try to grab them up? I you know, and, and that's I think been a, a big part of it too. Is is finding them? You know, the the certainly the World War Two and Korean and Vietnam veterans. They collect. They they do things together. I think more of uh, the most recent recent veterans are, are individuals. I think more individuals. They don't they don't seem to to group up and certainly don't join. I I don't think in in the numbers of the other uh, conflicts like the American Legion or the VFW. So they're they're hard to uh, to track down. Is is probably uh, a, a big part of it. My my biggest source through the years was I used to be on the board of honor flight and I'd get, I would get the, uh, the, um, the flight list and write everybody. So that was very easy. And then, you know, probably the second biggest source is, you know, you'd interview a veteran and they tell two friends who tell two friends, but yeah, so I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't just haven't cracked that group. Hmm. And it's interesting that you brought up, they don't collect up in the same way that the other groups do. What, how do the other ones collect up that, that, Newer generations don't seem to. Well, uh, like I said, I you know you, I think if you talk to anybody at the uh, the VFW and and or the American Legion, uh, I think like any service 
organization, Rotary, whatever, I think that's on the decline. Memberships are on the decline. So they don't uh, seem to join that. Uh, you know, you have the VFW or the, uh, the Vietnam guys that, uh, uh, that like to collect and, and uh, get together. I just, um, I don't know. I, I, I just feel like they're more individual individualistic than uh than the other groups I, I you know pure speculation yeah yeah well and that's what i think that i was i was very excited one of the things is one obviously to hear the stories and the collections that you've brought to the table is, is fascinating and i love to learn from history i love to learn from you know hopefully if somebody else has walked a similar path to me what what insights can i take away from it and that's what I've really enjoyed about tapping into some older generations and hearing their stories, but common threads. And it's interesting that you brought up that they group up and then for some reason ours doesn't. Do and that. I, like I said, I could be wrong in that regard. I just haven't, I haven't found the, the collective groups uh, uh, with these groups, but, but I agree with you. I would, I would love to connect the older and the younger uh, to, to share their experiences to, you know, these guys have walked the walked the road now, and it's anything I think would be helpful for the new guys to, you know, uh, the, I, I think we're kind of shameful in our past history of our, how our veterans were treated and how how they were um, learning. Of you know, I, I guess one thing that bugs me, and and I could be once again wrong. I didn't serve, but it seems like the government's very good about taking a civilian. And molding them into a into a warrior, but then when the time comes to uh, to let them go, it, it is it's like okay, sign here, thanks, you're you're out, uh, you know, uh, thanks for your service. Instead of that that same procedure to to bring them back from a warrior down to a, a civilian again, and and I think uh, you know, sadly, our previous or older vets have walked a pretty rough road. And you know, thank God, I think we're starting to learn. Uh, we need to that we need to treat our, our veterans better and 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 help them along. And and I, I just um, I just think there would be there would be a lot of good to connect our old and and new veterans together. I think they could both learn from each other. To be quite honest with you, yeah. how was it for just with that too? How and how was it for like World War II veterans coming back home? Um, is it similar? Because I, I only know, I, we hear so much about what it's like for veterans now, were there common threads of what they dealt with, or did it seem like my impression of it is they just kind of came back and were like, well, we're getting back to work. Well, uh, that's just it. Yeah. It, 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 there's very distinct, uh, distinct lines. I mean, the world war two, I mean, that generation I think was humble to begin is humble to begin with, but yeah, their uh, uh, the philosophy there was they got back home and, uh, you know, kind of just brush themselves on and and went on with life. I remember one guy uh, uh, in the South Pacific gone for two and a half years, uh, had, you know, had children at home, you know, missed out on two and a half years. He got home on a Thursday and was back at his old job on Monday. And there was just, you know, you know that that was just the attitude. Uh, the Korean guys, uh, they were, you know, Truly, the, the the you know forgotten veteran Nomer is uh, is definitely uh, uh, describes that group. I think the Viet to me the Vietnam and our our present conflicts have have very similar are, are very similar and that I think those are the two groups I would probably match up with the, the Vietnam and and our, our our most recent conflicts. There's just to me a lot of similarities in that regard, although. Um, you know the nice thing about most recently we've we've come to appreciate uh, our veterans when they get home. Whereas with the Vietnam, uh, as you know, with the Vietnam vets, it was despicable how uh, how they were treated when they when they returned home. It, it was. I actually just did an interview with a Vietnam veteran recently, and I was asking. I was curious to ask him about his experience coming back. And he was like, honestly, I don't know if they just weren't where I landed. He was like, but I never experienced it. I. I landed back in the States. I think he landed up in Northern California and got on another airplane, flew back home in Texas, I believe. And he was like, and then I just started working and I never, there was nobody around. So he, for, in his experience, it 
it, very obviously the Vietnam veterans were treated as a whole and then not great way. And it was interesting that his, he was like, I'm, I, I know that it was there and I just never had to even think about it. But that was very much, he was very much more like the World War II vet that I asked him what his experience was, what, what stood out to him. And he was like, I got back to work, got married. Yeah. And yeah. I've been married to my wife for 40, you know, 40 years. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Just incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So you think um, a lot of similarities with Vietnam and the current generation different than the World War II veterans? I think so. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I'm certainly no expert. Um, yeah. I, th- you know, I think if you describe the last I guess they call it the good war it was World War II. And, and, you know, I think there's been controversy between, and, well, in Korea, I think Korea was probably a good or just war. I don't know if that word should even be attached to that. But, but Vietnam and, and our most recent conflicts, I mean, there's a lot of controversy as to why we were there, what was the, the end game, uh, how it ended. I mean, those are, to me, are the similarities. Hmm. It's such an interesting thing to think about just coming back home from war and, you know, having gone into the edge of the initial invasion in Iraq, went back again uh, for another deployment uh, shortly after that. And just having our experience of it, it just, it fascinates me to think about other generations that I think when I was younger, I was very young and and I'll just speak for me personally. You know, I think my, my biggest thing when I went to, when I was in the initial invasion in Iraq was I was like, I wonder if I'm going to be home before I turn 21. You know, like, am I, you know, I was like, is that really, you know, you're like you're in a war zone. Like, why are you thinking about that? And um, it's interesting to me to reflect on it and think about, just wonder what it was like for, for other generations that went off uh, and, and fought and, and their generations war. So, well, you know, and, and, once again, I, I go back to the fact that I didn't serve, and what a, a common thread that always seems to uh, weave through all my interviews is, you know, I look at these people, uh, you know, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old, and what they went through, and it's like, you know, what, what was my life like during that period? What my biggest worry was that math test on Wednesday, and would that cute girl in English ever go out with me? And and the the, the, the big uh, pressure or the week is, you know, what are we going to do on Friday night? You know, what's going on? And, and here, these you and these other veterans are in war zones. And that, that's another thing, too, that I, I can't wrap my head around is is a war zone. I mean, I know it's man-made, but it's got to be the most unnatural place for a human to be in. And I, I don't understand it. I think for me, and I was just talking to a buddy that just reminded me, I was talking to him last week. But for me, I always, I've always thought about it just every... I, I personally, I think war has been around for <clears throat> as long as mankind. Oh, and yeah. I think that as long as we have mankind, it's going to be there. And, yeah. and it, it, while the battlefield's going to change, that it's it's always going to be a part of it. And so I've always compartmentalized it in that manner that that was just me being able to go and, and serve my country and be a part of it. So it wasn't, I didn't view it in this grandiose way. It was just me going to do what I'd signed up to do. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense, but I'm sure. And the other thing that it makes me think about too, was interesting is it's having doing two deployments. A, a common theme that we had was, you know, we left the initial invasion in Iraq, came back home. And for us, we had our platoon was supposed to go out on a MU and uh, a Marine expeditionary unit where we jump on the Navy boats and we travel and go from San Diego. And we were supposed to just bounce around. We were going to go to Hawaii, Australia, you know, just do the, live the life. Yeah. And, right. Uh, we ended up essentially, we went to Hawaii and did a training up, um, there, but went basically straight to Iraq. I went, got dropped off in Kuwait, went right back in. And one of the things that we remembered was that all the time that we were home, I think we were home for, I don't know the time frame, I'm spe- guessing nine months, but it felt like that was just a little, that nine months of being home was a dream. And it felt like we had just never left that, that space. And it was, it was, it was just interesting having to to go back over again, um, but I, I just don't I don't think about it in that way. And it's a it's a conversation that my sister has with me often. She's like, "Well, you don't 
you don't realize like what it's like to talk to you having gone to war. Like I, I just did what I did what I signed up to do. It doesn't. I, I did did your sister and I don't know if you were married before before you uh, went off, but uh, in your, talking about your sister, does she, does she see a different person than? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I've I've never asked her that actually, uh, yeah. and I I feel like I probably probably should. Um, I noticed joining joining the military was a big shift in general, so I would say yes, but we haven't uh, we haven't had a big deep conversation about it, you know. And one interesting thing that that I discovered recently through just another interview actually with a spouse um, was the. I've always told myself, I'll share whatever you want to share. Like I, I'm an open book and just yeah. ask me, like, I just tell people all the time, just ask me. And I was talking to my buddies, uh, a friend of ours, her, his wife has been married and through three deployments. He's still in the reserve. So now he's just a lot of stuff, but she said her biggest thing was she's never known what to ask. And it, so she always loves when he gets together with his buddies because they just start talking and she hears the stories that she wants to hear. And she's like, I don't know how to open that up. And it was a big aha for me that I think I might've seemed more closed off than I intended to be because I wouldn't, I would never bring it up. I would just say, hey, well, just ask me about it. Nobody asked. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, I didn't hurt my feelings that, and then I, I thought about it. I was like, wow, my sister probably never asked because I bet she didn't know what to ask. You know, and I know I, I talked to her about it after the fact and she said I was always very open and that. Um, she never felt like I was, but, um, it's, it's an interesting space. So, well, I tell you, I, I think if I had a dollar for every, uh, child or spouse that said, you know, we, we didn't, thanks for doing this. We didn't know his story. You know, I'd, I'd be doing this broadcast from my own private Island somewhere. It's just, and, you know, and you talk to the, to the, to the, the guys about it and they said, well, you know, I didn't want to put this on my family. I, or I, they don't, they wouldn't understand unless you were there, I wouldn't understand. I'll talk to my buddies about it. So they've, they've closed off from, from, uh, from a, quite a few of them, most of them actually. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. Uh, we had a, probably my proudest cause I'm, I'm, uh, I don't, I'm not very boastful of, of my time and service. Yeah, I, I put this stuff up just so I think anybody watches a new video. I want to like, if they're like, who's this guy talking about the military, yeah. at least you yeah, can right. see that I was in the military and that's, but if you go around my house, like this, there's not, there's not a lot of stuff around so much. So like this veterans day, my son gave me a, his school, he drew a little picture that said happy veterans day. And, and he, he was like, dad, did you know it's veterans day? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, what did you, you know, what'd you talk about at school? And he was like, I told my teacher that my dad's a veteran and it like hit me in my core. It was like my proudest moment of ever being a veteran. Oh, wow. And and for whatever reason, it just, it, it gave me all the feels, but I started looking at, um, my son loves to collect all my medals from races. If I do races and stuff like that, like, mar like I did a marathon or just a half or whatever. He just likes the medals. I was like, I never thought to do it, but I've never actually, I don't have any of my medals, like all my, like some veterans have like shadow boxes and stuff like that. I showed it to my wife and she's like, why do we not have this stuff printed up? And I was like, honestly, I don't have a good reason why not. And yeah. It was, it struck me that that's something I started ordering just to be able to give to my family and, and kind of let them into that world um, and learn from the people that didn't share, you know, because I think that the family really does want to know about it. And I don't want to, you know, and that's what I like about learning from these past generations and, and being able to have conversations like this. That's why I'd love to tap into your knowledge of kind of what they, what they experienced with it. Right, right. Well, along those lines, it reminds me of a story of a, a World War II uh, Marine that was on Iwo Jima, sole survivor of his unit, badly injured in the hospital for a year and a half afterwards. Years later, his, his son comes up to him and says, well, Dad, I, can you drive me down to the costume store? And he goes, well, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm in a play and I need, I need a military uniform. He goes, well, why don't you just wear mine? And he goes, you were in the military? <laughs> I mean, this incredible story, you had no clue, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, <laughs> I think a lot of people are uh, kind of in, in that same boat, but with no ill will towards it. Oh, no, just, no. It's just, yeah. you know, uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, it, it'll it come up whenever it, it, it manifests itself. Right. Uh, in that case, a Halloween costume just. <laughs> so yeah. with that too, because 
of you mentioned the World War II families not hearing about it. Um, so you've connected with a lot of the families as well. Oh, very much so. Yeah, uh, they. Uh, uh, well, not not many of the family. I'll, I'll, you know, the funny thing is, I'll hear years later uh, from uh, from family members that you know we, we were dad's past. We wanted to let you know that dad's past, and uh, we discovered you know going through his stuff that this this interview and oh, thank you for doing this. We didn't know we had this, and uh, so if, I'll. I'll that connection, the starting, I mean, I've met quite a few during the interviews, but I'm starting to meet more now years later as, as they're coming across these interviews. And, and, uh, I mean, I've had a couple that, uh, found, uh, found their dad on, uh, on YouTube, didn't realize they, you know, once again, that humbleness, I guess, of just putting it aside, but, uh, jumping on sharing it, it's wild to think that they would do the interview and then not share it with anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, I, mean, I, I can only imagine how those families felt to be able to step into uh, their loved ones, their, you know, their deceased loved ones, a little bit of their past. So it's, you're doing amazing things. And, and I've always had, I mean, one vision that's kept <clears> me going through uh, all these years, I've always had this vision that, you know, someday that the grandchildren of these veterans are going to sit down with their grandchildren and, pop this thing in and say, you know, I'd like you to meet my granddad or my grandma. I mean, I just, I've always just had this, this vision that when I was at my lowest, I just kept going with that vision. Mm. So, yeah. Was it a, is it a struggle for you or has it been a struggle to keep, keep interviewing and to keep it all going? Uh, yeah, I suppose it has. I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> How come? But, oh, just financially. I mean, the, the, the thing is, you know, when I when I first started this thing out, it was just it was just purely a uh, a side hobby. Like I said, once again, just to to satisfy my my love of history. But as I started hearing more and more stories, it's like uh, things started to change. And and I can tell you the day that uh, the trajectory made a sharp turn from that. I I had gotten a call the next morning from the from the wife of a, a World War II veteran. I'd interviewed him the day before, and and she said, you know. It, I'm just calling to thank you for doing this. You know, the kids and I don't know his story and we look forward to getting the DVD and uh, watching it. She goes, but I also wanted to let you know that last night was the first time in 60 some years he slept through the night and it was game over. After that. I pretty much just dropped everything else I was doing and uh, uh, just took on just this, this project just consumed me and it just vowed that I was going to do anything I could to help and honor veterans in any way I can. So, uh, you know, from a financial or business standpoint, it wasn't very wise, the, my approach, but uh, certainly no regrets in, when, in what I've done. So, well, so just from simply, I don't say simply, um, but from being able to share the story allowed him to sleep through the night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, I, and I've since fall. you know, he had stuff to get off his chest, you know, and, and that, and that's what I, I, I that's why I'd like to connect the old and the new. And, and I, and I vowed then, like I said, it, it just, I just became totally consumed and I, and I wanted, I don't, I don't want most, you know, certainly the our most recent guys, there's no reason that they, for the next 60 years can't sleep. We, we've got to do everything to make sure that that, that ends that uh, we, we do whatever we can to make sure that for, for example, your, yourself, uh, you, I want you to sleep now. I don't want you to go sleepless for the next 40 years. Have you seen other or heard from other veterans that have said that the similar thing that after opening up and sharing? Yeah, and, and it's happened numerous times uh, since then. And then and then the other end of the spectrum uh, as well, you know, there, there's really two groups that I come across when I do interviews. Those that, you know, experience things that they just soon not talk about or share again and you know i respectfully back away from that but there's the larger group that'll say oh i didn't do anything i don't have a story and and i'll argue until i'm blue in the face with that group and there was one guy that uh yeah he was the poster child for that vietnam veteran and his wife actually set up the interview um and up to the point that until i turned the camera on he said i don't know why i'm sitting here i don't have a story blah 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 of course he had a story it ended up he had a great story uh, well, a story great isn't always 
the exact word, but she called me like a couple weeks later and she goes, Brad, you know, we just sat down and watched that, that interview or the DVD. And she goes, I just wanted to tell you for the last three days, he's been walking around with his chest puffed out. So he realized, you know, you know, we did have a story. So, yes. yeah. Wow. And I, that's very interesting to think that how long he's been walking around thinking he didn't have a story to yeah, share. Oh, exactly. And, yeah. Hmm. yeah. I guess over time you start to believe it. If you keep telling yourself that, you know, for depending on how much time goes by, I mean, you're going to start believing that thing that you're telling yourself about it. And then once you, That's right. once you yeah. lay it all down there and you're like, wow, well, it actually was pretty So Yeah. So I, uh, like when I, like I said, when I first started out, I thought, oh, the, the benefactor of, of these is going to be the families that didn't know the story. And then, and then it's, it's down on record and that's proven to be obviously the case, but yeah, the, there, there's therapeutic value to, uh, to these as well. I, I'm certainly no expert. I'm no therapist. And I think these guys just need an outlet to, to tell their story and to hear himself talk, I think, uh, is, has been beneficial. They say that the, and it, it brought to mind a few things, but the idea that, <clears throat> you know, happiness, it happens not from the experience, but the reflection of the experience. And that's why journaling, writing down gratitudes is such a powerful thing because it's the reflection of it that Absolutely. builds the value and, and the appreciation of it. And thinking about veterans that aren't sharing and, and for, for whatever reason they have to not share that the moment they finally get to share it and think about it, they're like, oh, wow. I actually am really proud of that that time, and that really was a, a an amazing thing. So I can definitely see that. And then I know you said you're not a therapist, and um, I appreciate you sharing that out there. I know you're you're very humble with everything that you're you're doing, um, but the idea that there's this old management article that uh, that, that I've always thought about with with just being a veteran, and that the don't take the monkey. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but if some, if two people, if somebody comes and vents to you and they are just complaining about their day that the, they give the monkey to you and now you have this complaint on your back or their problem, they give you their problem and it's sitting with you. But if you just keep holding it, you'll just keep holding all these monkeys will just be clinging to you. But the moment you share th things and things like your story or allowing people to share it, you get to like that, that monkey leaves your, your back mm. and if they've been holding that story for so long, never having shared it, not only the appreciation, appreciation of being able to reflect on the good they did, but if there was anything that they, they just wanted to get out that, you know, I could see that would be a, a heavy ruck to finally drop down. All right. That's amazing. I, I absolutely, I, I love what you're doing. Uh, what can you share about the Korean, Korean war veterans? Cause you, you mentioned earlier, uh, kind of forgotten about. Um, yeah, that uh, it, it certainly, you know, it's obviously, you know, you've heard it's called the, the forgotten war and the uh, forgotten veteran and, and uh, they truly have. I mean, it, it, we, we had uh, the World War II, which obviously was just a major world event and then caught in that gap. And then the other side is it was Vietnam and those guys uh, were just forgotten. And, and I, you know, they were an amazing group of people too. I mean, it was a, in a, a short period of time, you know, I think uh, it was what a, a two year, three year war, you know, 38,000 were killed and Vietnam went on for a decade and 58,000 were killed. So, uh, you know, it was a major, major war for us. I mean, it's still considered a, a conflict. I think I don't even see. And, and, and the thing that I always like to point out, uh, I think, you can say whatever you want about our, our military and, and our politics and such, but that is a prime example of what the American soldier did for the world. When you look at, if you've ever seen that nighttime satellite photo of the Korean peninsula, and, and you can see the DMZ, it's very distinct. Everything south of the DMZ is lit up like a, like a, you know, like a Christmas tree. Everything north is pitch black. And what we've, what we went off and did for that country. And uh, it's just, just to, to me, an example of the American soldier and, and the good we do in the world. Hmm. What, how many interviews have you done with Korean vets? Uh, maybe about a hundred. 
Okay, yeah. so it's a substantial amount. Yeah. What thoughts or feelings do they have about about their experience, their time in? They're they're probably probably closer linked to the uh, to the World War II guys. Just went off, did their thing, came home. You know, and it was a little bit different. You know, each obviously each war is different. I mean, you said you had a number of uh, deployments, and a lot of these guys multiple employments. You know, the World War II guys went off, and they were in. The government had it. It was open ended. You, you came yeah. home and we were done. Uh, Korean uh, that changed. That they, they, I think they just did a one one year. Some of them did. I think a thirteen month uh, deployment, uh, and then uh, Vietnam was just one. And then, but then it changed again with you guys. So, uh, but the, so yeah, a lot of them. It's they're, they're very similar to the World War Two guys, and a lot of them uh, were in World War Two, served and went off, and then got called up again. So I, mm. I would I would probably link them into uh, bundle them in the uh, the World War II crowd in that uh, went off did my uh, did my thing came back and brushed myself off went to work you know moved on with life so yeah it's interesting to me just to see those comparisons and, and it hit me also earlier about the grouping together how the you know the VFW just all of that is, is shrinking down which I and personally I've never I haven't joined, haven't explored it, and and I don't have any good reason um, why or why not. I think, um, and actually, I just had a, a thought that hit me with that. Um, yeah, I always thought about it as an older, older yeah, generation right. or a different different generation. But the social media, yeah, my my phone's over over there. But I think there's a lot of social media groups that I think give the the feeling of that camaraderie, but it's not as visible as a you know you're driving down the road and you see the vfw it's there whereas if there's a social media or a private social networking right, group right like i know i was a <clears throat> sniper in the marines so and if you're a marine corps scout sniper there's actually a private social media group just for anybody that's a marine corps scout sniper sure. you can right. you send in your dd214 and or you know and there's other ways of, of verifying you but you can join so i wonder how much that masks it but it's interesting that that too, because something that I, I talked to another veteran earlier uh, is that they feel not understood by other veterans. And I wonder how much that goes into it. And have you heard anything like that where veterans like, of one generation don't feel connected to veterans of another generation? I know I've heard from a number of Vietnam veterans that came back and went to join the VFW or the American Legion and were told by the guys there, oh, you know, that wasn't a war you were in. I mean, there, there, there's a little bit of uh, uh, hostility there still from some of the guys. It's like, I, I walked away from there and never, never even thought about joining again because mm. uh, the World War II and Korean guys saw Vietnam a little bit different. And I can tell you, there's one thing that was that really stood out with me is, um, like I said, I was on the board of uh, Honor Flight, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Honor Flight or your or your uh, your viewers, but it's a it's a program that takes uh, veterans back to World uh, DC to see all the various uh, monuments and such. And it started out as purely uh, to take World War II veterans back, and we were one of the first hubs that started taking Korean and then Vietnam. And they, it, for the longest time, uh, we did. Uh, 22 flights and probably, oh, I don't know, probably about the 15th flight, we started taking Vietnam veterans. And there was a very distinct change in the the aura of the flight. Uh, I, I, could, I couldn't believe how much drastic, I mean, it was a drastic, the, the trip, they were all great trips, but it was, uh, there was some anger. I you could tense the, feel mm. the anger w w when the Vietnam veterans started going. It was it, it just it complete. It was still like I said, still a great trip. But uh, boy, you could you could and you talk to anybody that was involved with that, and they'd probably all say the same thing. Yeah, the mood changed when we started taking the Vietnam veterans. How so? And what was the change? I, I think it was. Um, there was anger. There was, uh, I think, there was there was some anger. The the uh, the previous trips you had, uh, you know, uh, we asked everybody. We gave him t shirts so he, you know, kind of keep look out for each other and and, and keep everybody together. And uh, and 
it, it was everybody just kind of went as as the tour went and with the Vietnam vets, it, you know, it's like, no, I don't want to wear a shirt. I'm going to wear my, my vest and I'm going to go off and do this. Oh, I may not go, may not go with, with you on that one. It was just, um, like I said, it was, uh, I, I'm overemphasizing it probably, but, but there was a change. There was a, there was just a, a different aura or a different mood on, on those trips. Uh, and then the, the last bunch were just purely by then we started losing pretty much all the, World War II veterans and Korean, so it'd be a handful, uh, but mostly Vietnam. And yeah, it was just uh, it was just a different trip. And and amazingly too, uh, from a health standpoint, you know, when we started taking taking uh, Vietnam veterans, I was talking to Stan Cass, who uh, was the Colonel Stan Cass, who led up the program. I said, "Well, Stan, I guess we we can cut back on our medical personnel and." And um, and the number of wheelchairs we take, he goes, no, no, we got to ramp up. We, we we took more wheelchairs in the later flights than we ever did uh, in the earlier flights with the World War II guys. It was, um, yeah, mm. yeah. Wonder why why it is we do that because that's definitely something that today still happens, where we're almost getting segregated into a different, even from people from this this one war over in you know Iraq Afghanistan that that's happening with that so it's interesting i wonder why uh we we do that as veterans yeah hmm. i can't figure it it also i want to say it's solace is the right word just knowing that it it was still happening then doesn't make it right today it almost brings me a little joy knowing that it wasn't it's not a new thing that's just right sparking up today because i think that i heard somebody i was well oh no it was about that there's this thing about combat veterans and it's like like that's a that's a thing like different than a veteran and it's like some combat you know combat veterans that well, say they're different than a regular veteran well that's what i you know and that's one thing i can't i can't sort out either and i don't know uh with your group if it's uh, how much it plays into it, but you know, you you look at uh, you got your World War II veterans, you got your Korean veterans, and then you get to the Vietnam War, and you're either a Vietnam veteran or you're a Vietnam era veteran. They're a very if you if you don't, uh. if you weren't boots on the ground, you're a you're a Vietnam era veteran, and 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 I I don't I don't get that, and I don't I don't see a, you know an Afghan or. A, a, Iraqi era veteran, uh, it, that one certain group, it's like, you know, if you weren't, you were, if you weren't in country, you're an era veteran. And it, mm. I, I, and everybody I talked to, nobody can seem to answer that question. I, I can't, uh, it's like why it's there, why it's there. I mean, you know, World War II, Korea, you know, nobody, not everybody was over in the Pacific or over in, over in, uh, Europe. There was, you know, uh, here in the States. I mean, once again, I, I I don't I try not to comment on it on it because I'm not a veteran. But I mean, you know, I I truly appreciate the appreciate the frontline veterans that were up at the tip of the spear. But you know, for every one of those guys, there's ten people behind them that need to support that. Mm -hmm. And and to me, they're <clears throat> just as important. Oh yeah. But um, I wonder, and I'm excited to dive deep into that or deeper because it's it's interesting and and again makes me happy to see that it's similar. It doesn't make it okay. Yeah, right. Because I see it now, and I'm like, why, why, why are we, you know? Because I, I, I'm just happy that anybody served. Simply because, Absolutely, like you said, yeah. like there's, it, no matter what you did, no matter what role it was, it, there's, I think, ninety percent are gonna. There's a needs to be ninety percent of support to to be able to get the boots on the ground, and they're equally as important because without and, them, and, it doesn't and, happen. And, and uh, coupled with that, I mean, when when you enlisted, went off, uh, and or or if Uncle Sam pulled you out the door. The minute you signed up, you had no clue where, where you, what your lot was going to be, where you were going. You didn't know if uh, you're going to the front line or, you know, back in Ohio peeling potatoes the whole time. So, right. you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't understand it. But once no. again, I, I try to back off from it because I'm not a veteran and uh, I don't feel like I've got a right to, uh, to weigh well, in on it. And I, I can understand it. it's a very common thing that, you know, for a lot of civilians to not want to chime in and, and I can, I can definitely respect that. 
Um, although I do think that just given the nature of 600 interviews with various generous generations of veterans and, and conflicts and wars, and it's, I think you have a, a lot of knowledge on it. It made me think of just being in, you know, I was a recon Marine and once you in the Marine Corps, and I don't, I would imagine it's still the same today. Um, but when, when I was in the, any Marine, you get your green PT care, you get your green silkies, get your green shirt. And that's your, that's what you work out in. But once you graduate, um, from Marine reconnaissance school, you get black PT gear and that's the way you earn black PT gear. And, uh, and I remember just being at our unit, like there better not be anybody that's hasn't been through the school wearing black PT gear. Oh, right, because yeah. Somebody's going to go say something. And, and I really yeah. like, that's such a small thing, but it seems such a, like a similar parallel to you weren't, you know, blank if Vietnam bear error versus Vietnam uh, right. veteran. Right. And it, it seems like a very similar thing that it's one of those, like I earned it. So you can't claim it. Right. Right. Um, and not saying it's right, wrong and different, but it seems like it's happening on a small scale. So it doesn't surprise me that it's happening on a, mm. on a larger scale uh, yeah. as well. Cause I'm definitely guilty of the, the black PT gear. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing, but it, it's, it's interesting to see it because on the flip side, now that so many veterans that, that haven't deployed, that's also one thing that's, that's coming up uh, with the, the newer generation of veterans because it's so many veterans have been able to deploy or, you know, as they have been able to, a lot of veterans uh, or a lot of people in the military want to, especially if there's a conflict, that's something they want to go do, but several don't get to. Right. And there's almost this a depressive nature around not having, you know, I was in the military, but I didn't get to go over. And they have a guilt that they're holding by not going, which is an interesting thing to see. Have it you is, inter yeah. have you interviewed from different generations people that were uh, maybe a Vietnam era veteran that didn't actually get boots on the ground? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Like I said, uh, I, the only rule I've got with my project is I have no rules, and so yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Particularly, I mean, what is really interesting uh, is the uh, World War II veterans, those that uh, stayed stateside or didn't get into the action, and even more so that those that uh, through uh, uh, medical conditions or whatever couldn't enlist at all. And there is a deep shame with that group that, uh, uh, that, that those that never served or stayed stateside that uh, that they didn't get into the action even you know years later still um but with the vietnam guys i'm trying to think some of the the era veterans um they would i guess they were a little bit more modest well you know don't have much of a story i you know i was in california or i was i was on okinawa the whole time didn't didn't get it in the country um don't really, I guess, talk too much about it. it yeah, I don't know how. Uh, just trying to think of some of the the era veterans that I met. Um, yeah, they don't really, I guess, one way or the other, talk too much about uh, their thoughts on that. Other hmm. than, and and some of them you know, say, in what I know now, you know, thank God I didn't I didn't go into country, you know, right. So. Well, and at the end of the day, and, and and you mentioned it earlier, but it, when you sign up, you have no. Well, that's that's you don't really have a choice. Yeah, yeah. Like, nobody it, asked it, me if I wanted to go. It, 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 exactly. <laughs> and, yeah, and I was yeah. happy to, but it just for anybody yeah. that didn't go, it's I I know like I wouldn't judge somebody because you didn't get a choice. Right. Like the military, like the one thing I know for a fact is the military really doesn't care what you want. Yeah, right. One yeah. way or the other, like they yeah. really don't care. They're going to yeah. do what they need to be done. What needs to be done, and that's just how it rolls. So yeah. Uh, and, and, and my, like I said, my philosophy is anybody that served in the military, they're all standing around the spear. Some of them are closer to the tip, but you know, a lot, hell of a lot closer to the spear than I ever got. So uh, uh, there's just a deep respect for that. Yeah. I, I, I shared the same thing. I, I love um, anybody that's willing to, to step up and, and just sign on the dotted line. So yep. man. Matt, thank you so much for for taking some time and, and oh, I, I appreciate this time. Very jumping enjoyable. in to yeah. to share just what you're doing, and and I definitely encourage anybody to to jump on. You said the best place to to find your interviews is on YouTube. Yeah, that's where I uh, 
they can get a general idea of what uh, what they're all about and okay. some, what's some, some great stories to be sure. I'm going to go uh, remember and honor on YouTube. Uh, I know I'm already subscribed. What's that? I remember and honor stories, I think is the remember best Remember and honor stories. Yeah. All right. And then um, I'm already sub subscribed. I'm going to go seek out, uh, you said Roy Lehman? Lehman, yeah. Lehman? yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the video is the, the soldier and the little girl. Okay. I'm going to yeah. go find that one. I'm also going to go grab your book. Uh, no, thank you. Reflections of Our Gentle Warriors. Well, it uh, sounds just amazing. And it just having those bite-sized chunks, knowing that I could grab and read a section. Um, I'm, thank you so much. I know you're doing a ton of stuff here in our local area. You're not far from me. Uh, you do a ton of stuff for veterans. And I'm excited to come out and, and check out y'all's breakfast uh, here on, this, yeah, on Saturday morning. Yeah, very much so. You need to get down for the uh, the, uh, the Pam Vet breakfast on Saturday mornings out on level, and that's, uh, that's good fun for sure. I had. It's yeah. amazing that I had no idea that that is even happening. And it's it's under 10 minutes from my house. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm excited to come check it out and, and oh, meet everybody. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. You betcha.